Now, one of the topics I'd like to discuss today is how major investors are moving into gold. This is a trend we've seen even at Miles Franklin, where we've Andy Sheckman on our last interview had been saying that, you know, he's been receiving giant orders lately, um, six figure orders. And one of the things that you just reported on is how a major software company is actually investing $50 million in gold. So your perspective, is this a start of a trend? I'd like to say yes. That would be the, you know, woohoo, happy, happy, joy, joy answer here. Uh, but forgive me, it's not my job to be a cheerleader and say, yes, this is it. We're going to the moon tomorrow. I don't know. It, it could be. My point really was that it was a significant event. And unlike the Michael Saylor moment of Michael Saylor's software company putting a large chunk of its treasury into Bitcoin, this was actually a fairly prudent, reasonable, moderate move on this company, Palantir, on their part to harden their balance sheet, not just strengthen, but harden their balance sheet against unknown uh, black swan events in the future. So 50 million for a company that big, it's actually pretty small. It's not this giant risky move. They didn't put their company at risk if, if gold suddenly drops 50%, which is maybe less likely in gold than in Bitcoin, but it, it's nothing like that. So it's I think it's significant because it's not just gambling because I'm a true believer in gold or something, a prudent company could make such a move is a good thing. And I won't wax too rhapsodic about this, but I want to bring up, I know that you've talked to Rick Rule in the past, and one of his favorite things to mention on this subject is that historically, over preceding decades, the average um, allocation to gold as a safe haven asset in global financial assets has been around 2%, and that currently it's about one half of 1%. So if allocation, you know, this insurance allocation to a safe haven asset were just to revert to the recent historical mean, it would quadruple the investment demand for gold, which obviously, you know, would send it off to the races price wise. So I'm not predicting that would happen. But I think this is really interesting because, you know, up until now, Rick's been saying this for a long time. And there's been no indication that anybody's listening. There's been no indication that any mainstream companies, you know, not gold bug companies, but normal companies are even thinking about it. And if if this is a sign of a change in that way, it doesn't even have to revert to that mean. If it were to just go to 1%, it would double the investment demand for gold. And what would that do to the price? So I'm, I'm not promising the moon here. I'm saying watch this space. If it does catch on, I think it portends big things. And what are some of the signs then we would see that it would catch on? We'd see other companies doing similar. And it wouldn't be, you know, the the, um, the Keith Newmeyers of the world holding back silver and so on, you know, and, and God bless him for doing that. I, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying, of course, he's going to, you know, somebody like that will do it. He's a, he's a silver company CEO, right? So if some other technology company, or if Coca-Cola or somebody like that decided, you know what, or hey, here's an idea. What if Warren Buffett, who has dismissed gold as a pet rock for years, what if his company, Berkshire Hathaway, were to buy a gold miner? What would that do? Well, we saw what that did last last year. Very interesting. So who knows? You know, maybe, maybe things will take off, but that's the thing to look for. Look for mainstream, not gold bug companies. Look for mainstream players taking out a little bit of insurance in gold. If that becomes a trend, that trend will be our best friend. You mentioned how there's a lot of investors moving into gold and gold is becoming more mainstream and there's the potential for it to become even more mainstream, right? Uh, and But silver has become, as you mentioned, it seems like not seen as much as a mo uh, as much as a monetary metal, which is kind of interesting because we've talked about this on the channel before. How silver historically has been actually more of a monetary metal than gold. So what is actually happening there? <laughs> so this is the one that gets me a lot of hate mail right now. I am a silver bug. My stacks of silver are bigger than ever. I'm not bearish on silver at all. Uh, people respond to the headlines and think, oh, they're they're bashing. So I'm not bashing silver in the first place. Every silver investor, um, you know, it's, it's your own risk if you ignore the data. First place, I'm just presenting data, okay? So don't get mad at me. If you want to get mad, get mad at the data. And how much sense does it make to get mad at the data, right? Okay, and the second place, <laughs> actually, I don't know if we've talked about it before, but I know that I've talked about this before. People have been saying for years, ah, silver, 
it's not really a monetary metal anymore. It's just an industrial metal. And I've always said, no, you know, you look at the price action and okay, yes, silver has a lot of industrial uses, but on a day to day basis, on a month to month basis, on a year to year basis, you look at the charts and silver moves with gold. The correlation is very high historically since uh, the gold and silver, well, gold price specifically was freed by Tricky Dick Nixon in 1971. Right. Historically, the average is a close to 0.9 of a correlation, an extremely tight correlation. And OK, sometimes the ratio between the two opens and closes, but they tend to move the same direction 90 percent of the time. That's and so people have been saying, oh, silver is becoming more of an industrial metal. And I've been resisting that. I've been saying no. But I pay attention to the data and the data says that over the last year, that correlation has broken down. Over the last year, the correlation between gold and silver prices actually dropped to about 0.2, which is almost no correlation at all. It's a massive drop. And if you think about our experience, you know, just watching these prices on a day to day basis, I'm sure that you and the audience, we've all looked at this as like, wow, gold's up today, but silver's off or silver's up today, but gold's off. You know, we, we've seen the relationship break down anecdotally, experientially, or heck that big, um, flash crash we had a couple weeks ago when gold and silver got whacked on a Sunday night, right? And gold came back that very night and recovered, you know, went on to recover, but silver didn't. It's remained low since then. So they're behaving differently. And that's really all I'm saying. I'm not saying silver is this, is not that. I'm saying the data says something has changed here and that is worth thinking about. Now, what does it mean? Okay, here we get into hypotheticals and the data does suggest that the market for now, at least, is looking at silver more as an industrial metal. And what I've posited, what I think we should think about, the so what is that, um, you know, as, as stackers, we don't care. You know, I just want to have my silver. But as a speculator on the stocks, I need to know where the price is going to go or where it's likely to go so I can invest accordingly. And what I'm suggesting is that the data is telling us that silver might start tracking copper more closely than gold. It's used in the electrification story. Its industrial use case is actually very closely tied to copper. And we've seen the market now sort of separate uh, and treat silver more like an industrial metal than a monetary metal. Like, like my objection from before is, no, look at the charts. They're going the same direction. That's changed. Now, maybe it's not permanent. You know, maybe this is a flash in the pan. But it is something to watch for because as speculators, as stock investors, we need to know what the trends, you know, what are the drivers in the trends? So I'm saying to watch out for that. With respect to what this really means then for investing, you mentioned how, you know, silver is, you know, you still have a huge silver position, more silver than you've ever had in the past. Um, does this really impact maybe the ratio of gold to silver people who are stacking should buy? Like, how does this really impact the investing situation for both gold and silver? My immediate, the immediate take is no, actually, I'm still very keen on uh, accumulating more silver. If I can find great silver stocks in particular, the, the, the stocks are really hard to find really good ones. Most of them have warts of some kind. And of course, as, as you and probably most of the audience understands, most silver is a byproduct, right? You know, a pure silver play is very hard to find. And in the so-called pure silver plays, it's really a lead or zinc mine that has more value in the silver than the lead or zinc. You, you can find native silver here and there, but nobody mines just pure silver, uh, or not in quantities. So for now, nothing really changes. And I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm very bullish on silver. I do think that um, in you know, it still has its monetary component. Investment demand is still a huge part of annual demand. It may go away in time, but right now it's it's really important. Uh, somebody asked me recently, well, what if we took out the investment demand and we just looked at silver price on the supply and demand fundamentals as an industrial metal? And I said, you wouldn't want to do that because if you took away the investment demand right now, that would that would take a large chunk of silver demand on an ongoing basis away and it would be bad for the price. Um, so. Immediately, nothing changes. I'm bullish. I think in the mania that I that I still expect ahead for gold and silver, that we could see triple digit silver prices. Not promising that. I think it's possible. And so I want to have the best silver plays that give me leverage to that upside I see in silver. But farther ahead, the implications are actually um, two different ones. One is 
after the the metals, the monetary metals mania, after the gold and silver bull really goes into its manic phase, uh, silver might do better than gold going forward because the industrial phase will still be there. Gold has its industrial uses, but they're really quite a bit more limited than silver's. So actually, this is a longer term, more bullish outlook for silver because I think the industrial case supports it more going forward. Um, but the other thing, though, is if it becomes more priced as a monetary metal and fewer and fewer uh, investors, institutions look at silver as a monetary metal, um, you know, that changes things. Uh, in particular, you know, banks used to have silver and now Basel III, like gold is a tier one asset, but not silver. Governments used to have silver hoards because even when they took silver out of circulation for some decades, there was always, you know, this fear that they might be forced back to it, so they held it, but then, you know, that went away. Governments have dishoarded silver. Uh, and where I'm going with this is, imagine a future world in which the fiat currencies that you and I uh, are so skeptical of, and I imagine the audience, you know, has, you know, uh, sees them going the way of the dodo when the emperor is revealed as having no clothes. If that actually happens, and we go back on some kind of gold standard, I, I think this emphasis of silver as an industrial metal means that there's a good chance it would not be a bimetallic standard or, or trimetallic. We wouldn't have gold, silver, copper coinage, and we wouldn't necessarily have gold and silver coinage. It might be just gold coinage, partly because silver is seen more as an industrial metal and partly because distributed ledger technology makes it easy to transfer gold in large or very small quantities. So you don't need silver to make change anymore. And that's a big argument we can get into, but that's that's the short version is just that silver historically was monetary metal in part because it made change gold, which was too much value concentrated to be practical for many transactions. If that's changed, then we may not see silver go back into circulation as money. Um, so the implication of that longer term is the longer term, like how much do I want to stack? If I think the world will actually go back to using something that's real, for money, then for that long-term outlook, I want to stack more gold than silver, physical, bullion I'm talking. Now, what kind of implication would this have for the gold-silver ratio? Because if we look at previous bull markets, the ratio falls. You know, 1980, it went to 15, 16 to 1, 2011, around 33 to 1 or around there. So if it gets to this where gold is re-monetized, but silver is not, would we just be in a world where the ratio stays high, like it is right now, 75 to one or even higher? Yes, well, let me, let me rephrase it this way. Another common ratio people look at is the gold to oil ratio. Now the world is electrifying, whether it should or not, and whether governments should subsidize it or not, it's happening, right? We're going to electric cars. You know, what the gold to oil ratio going forward, other things being equal, it will never be what it was historically again. If the world no longer burns petroleum products in vehicles starting in decades down the road, you know, basically that ratio will become a historic artifact. So, and analogously, if the world goes to a new gold standard, but it's not bimetallic and silver is not part of that, then the historic ratio, there's no reason to expect that to en endure. Now, no, I'm not saying therefore silver's going down or silver's bad or whatever. I'm just saying it's going to march to the beat of a different drummer. And the natural occurrence difference in the Earth's crust, I don't think that would define it. And the monetary use, I don't think that would define it. I think uh, if gold goes back into use as a gold standard, it becomes really stable. Its uh, price you know, or its exchange ratio for other currencies becomes really stable. But if silver is primarily an industrial metal, its price will tend to fluctuate more. So I'm not predicting a specific gold-silver ratio. Um, I'm saying that the gold-silver ratio may be less useful and more volatile as if gold settles down as money and silver continues to trade up and down as an industrial metal. One of the other metals that our viewers are keenly interested in is platinum as well. And one of the big arguments for that right now is that gold, so platinum is just above you know half of gold's price so normally platinum is above gold's price now do you think that kind of 
platinum gold ratio will become an artifact as well and we might more permanently see platinum below gold's price if gold is remonetized our friend rick rule likes to say that low prices are the cure for low prices and people look at platinum being below the price of gold and say oh that's a low price it should be cured by itself right i don't think so i think it fits in the kind of thing we're talking about if the use case for platinum which is largely industrial yes there is some you know, monetary aspect to platinum. And if you look at gold, silver, platinum, and palladium on a day-to-day -day basis, or at least until recently when silver's, you know, the correlation broke down, all four of those would tend to wiggle in the same direction. Um, the more industrial metals would respond to news differently. But if, if the so-called precious metals were going up, all four of them would tend to go up at the same time. All four would tend to go down at the same time. So there's, there is some of that there. But clearly platinum and palladium almost entirely driven by the industrial demand. And that's why, apart from the day-to-day knee-jerk changes, you would see those price trends change dramatically and why palladium has done so well in recent years as an industrial metal with supply constraint and why platinum has not done so well for years as an industrial metal with demand constraint. So, no, I don't... I don't think there's any reason, particularly with the electrification of transportation going forward, to be especially bullish on platinum going forward. The fact that it's cheaper than gold does not mean it has to become more expensive than gold again. And, and this is a good reminder for silver bugs too, because platinum is more rare than gold. In the Earth's crust, platinum is objectively a fact. It's more rare than gold. So how can its price be lower? Well, the price isn't set by rarity in the Earth's crust. The price is set by, in an industrial case, like a metal like that, it's set by supply and demand on its industrial use. So, yeah, don't get hung up on these ratios. They're not magical. They're not, they, uh, you know, whether it's God or the universe wrote them in the Earth's crust, yes, that's real. But it doesn't mean the market has to value them that way. Now, one of the last topics I wanted to discuss is what you recently wrote about how we've seen these essentially the mainstream narrative is that because rates are so low right now the only alternative for investments for investors are stocks and that's why we're seeing this huge increase in stock prices recently now your perspective is stocks are not the only alternative and why do you believe that i'm glad you bring that up because first and foremost this this new acronym that's really been buzzing my ears off over the last week or two, TINA. There is no alternative, T-I-N-A. People just say this like it's a fact, like it's written in the cosmic firmament. And it's just not true. But it's what they used to justify chasing high, already nosebleed valuations on Wall Street and chasing them higher because there is no alternative. I think it's an artifact. It's there because, as you point out, you know, most mainstream investors think of a portfolio as stocks and bonds, you know, risk on risk off, and you have some sort of balance. And if the bonds aren't working, because they guarantee a negative return, right, your bonds giving you one point whatever percent inflation's five, you know, bonds are broken, who wants bonds? So that there is no alternative in that view that, you know, narrow horse blinders mindset of stocks and bonds, well, the bonds are gone, all that's left is stocks, there's no alternative. But that's an artificial view. Take off the blinders. Look at the world. Obviously, commodities are an alternative, and don't just have to be commodities. Real estate is a perfectly reasonable alternative. It's not a stock or a bond. Um, but commodities, in particular, are I think worth thinking about because if you, if, and I don't have one handy, but if you look at those charts of the S and P 500 versus commodities or the Dow versus commodities, those kind of stocks versus commodities charts. Even with the recent increases in copper and tin and aluminum and other prices, gold and silver too, um, commodities are dirt cheap compared to stocks. They're still close to you know those multi-decade lows, cyclical lows. So not only is there an alternative, that, that narrative on Wall Street, it's just FOMO in disguise. It's just people trying to be cheerleaders for you know selling more and more stocks, chase these stocks, giving people a reason to chase the stocks. 